cost of living crisis is unfolding in America's major cities. We can't afford to live in this city if you're a working class New Yorker. The problems are acute in downtown Manhattan. One bedroom units are renting for nearly $4,000 a month on average. There's a reason people are willing to pay. It drives you and it motivates you and it keeps you hungry. It keeps you always thinking because no matter what, you know, there's somebody out there hustling more. There's somebody thinking something new. You can never become complacent. That's what's so beautiful about this city. People have returned to cities to see their friends and have a good time. That's pushing rents to new highs in places like Los Angeles, Chicago, and cities across the Sun Belt. While renters have returned, many commuters haven't, despite the return to office push from major companies like Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan. More days at home could help workers escape high city prices and long commutes, but there could be a cost to that decision. I think it's fairly hard to form high quality new relationships remotely. I think it's easier to maintain existing connections. There's just something about you know meeting in person that you can't replicate uh, virtually. During the pandemic, we saw some jobs where you know they could be done remotely. However, new hires dropped dramatically, about 40% for over a year and a half. This is really compatible with a view that firms had trouble onboarding new workers because it was difficult for them to learn. As prices keep rising across the country, we ask, are American major cities like New York still worth it? The biggest benefit of cities are the people. Being close to others in your field of work can unleash powerful benefits. Economists call this the theory of agglomeration. When there's a concentration of an industry in the city, that can make those firms and people more productive. You know, New York City is a good example. You have like this variety of restaurants that you just can't have in a population of 50,000 people. There's long been a hypothesis of agglomeration economies, which just means that we get more productive when we are enmeshed in a maelstrom of economic activity both because we can buy and sell, we can find workers to hire, we can find employers to hire us, and we can learn from one another. Within large cities, the benefit that you have is the diversity, right? It's the diversity of people, it's the diversity of culture, it's the diversity of you know ways of life. Um, and I think that is not what is always present in smaller cities, but you know I think that is an individual choice on the person to decide if they want to stay in a larger city or not be. Evan Robinson runs America on Tech, a nonprofit that teaches young professionals how to code. They have offices in Los Angeles, Miami, and New York City. We're looking at it from a data perspective about where are most underestimated communities located. And that happens to be you know, within or in proximity of the largest cities. Opportunities like this are one of the big benefits of cities. And it's what makes many consider them to be worth it, despite the costs. But in the age of remote work, Sunbelt cities are poaching talent from the old titans in Silicon Valley in New York. People are fleeing governments and places that they're not wanted or they feel that they're not wanted or where they're being taxed to death. A lot of these tech companies, they're saying, oh yeah, you can work remotely. But, you know, in many cases, they're also saying, like, we're not going to pay you quite the same amount. Making it in any major city has never been easy. I always wanted to, you know, uh, come into Manhattan, be a businessman in Manhattan. You can say anything negative you want to say. There's a lot of negative things to say about this place. It's a financial epicenter of the world, and it drives you, and it motivates you, and it keeps you hungry. It keeps you always thinking. That's the exciting part, right? And I'll be honest, actually, that's what the city has lost the most with COVID, is that it's lacking that energy. You walk around, you don't feel that energy. You don't feel that buzz. Before the pandemic, Manhattan could more than double in population during working hours. You're looking at a visualization of data that was collected by NYU's Wagner School in 2012. Although this hasn't been updated since the pandemic, we can clearly see Manhattan's heartbeat has changed since then. Foot traffic plummeted during the darkest days of the pandemic. At one point, consumer spending fell more than 50% across Midtown. The business community hopes that eventually those vacant storefronts get new tenants. Where I am most fearful is the retail space in the business districts. In the Grand Central area, you have about a 30% vacancy of all retail spaces. At best, we'll have two thirds of pre-pandemic level foot traffic in Midtown moving forward. Spending from high-skilled workers has kept major cities afloat through the years. Tech workers in particular have clustered into about eight major U.S. cities, raising issues of affordability in each. Prospects for the software engineers and data scientists in this cohort remain strong. 
For example, the median worker at Google made over $270,000 a year in 2020, according to SEC filings. Other workers fare pretty well too. The purchasing power of these specialists can shoot prices upward for housing and other goods. Silicon Valley is kind of maybe the most famous example where you know, it's really costly to live and there's a ton of regulation and yet software companies seem to continue to locate there. And a lot of that is because of agglomeration economies. If these workers leave the usual major cities, it could fundamentally change the economy. The ability to serve a latte with a smile was, you know, a path towards a steady paycheck. Now, when people stop going to, to work downtown, those jobs disappear. If we have a shift to hybrid work, Maybe that will mean fewer people in the offices, but you'll also see commercial rents going down and you'll see younger, scrappier firms replace older and more staid firms that have sent their office workers home. Hopefully those younger, scrappier firms will continue to demand things from the urban service workers and provide opportunity for you know, Americans who start with less. I am more worried about cities like Cleveland and Detroit that started on the edge of, of survival, where a decline in demand for offices can really mean just increased vacancies, which then spill through the urban service economy. The surge of people into major rental markets masks the sluggish return to normal in downtowns. Demand is still strong for city life because, well, it's fun. In 2018, the most recent year with data available, New York City had nearly 20,000 restaurants and over 2,000 bars. I mentioned kind of the diversity of restaurants, but there's also the mating market. Right? Like young people want to be in a market where they have other young people to meet and friends, right? Like we're kind of inherently social creatures and a density of social connections, which cities provide, is going to continue doing that going forward. But those connections will cost you. Quite honestly, the cost of living here has only gone up. It has not gone down. Quality of life has gone down in many ways. Rent hikes are hitting some previously affordable neighborhoods. Grocery prices are rising too, squeezing even the most frugal people. Economists believe that returns for living in a big city have flattened for less skilled workers since the 1970s. Cities should become fairer places. That while cities are relatively good places for adults, even for adults who don't have fancy degrees because there are these urban service sectors, they're really not great places for poor kids. As the likelihood of recession increases, leaders are trying to manage rising inequality. What we are announcing today is the largest investment in the city's history in support of vulnerable New Yorkers experiencing homelessness on our streets and subway. I think that that is the most important thing to getting people back here. You know, there's a significant decline in ridership on the subway, and a large part of that is if people can avoid taking it, they will. Transit ridership in New York remains well below pre-pandemic levels. If this trend continues, it could impact the quality of service down the line. It is absolutely true that public transit uh, becomes safer when there are more people who are taking it. This was Jane Jacobs' uh, fundamental insight, that in fact, having more people around makes places safe. The available data suggests New York is still much, much safer than it was during the 1970s. It may become slightly less safe, but they're still the best means to get around New York most of the time. Urban living today looks like a long commute to the office that may feel unnecessary or working remotely from a cramped and expensive apartment. This makes a return to the city seem like a raw deal for many people, especially if they can do their jobs from home. What is permanent about the pandemic? And what we thought was probably permanent was this change in the productivity of remote work. There is always a sort of curve for the adoption of new technologies. We would have gotten all these technologies fully adopted eventually, but the pandemic accelerated it. The theory of agglomeration shined in the late 20th century when fax machines and paper dominated offices. It'll be tested in an era of hybrid work. Our staff is coming into the office one to two days a week. What we have seen is that this creates more flexibility, um, this creates a more morale within our team and more work-life balance. I really think going forward, hybrid work is here to stay but so is very much face-to-face -face contact. It was exactly in the industries that were most capable of enabling remote work prior to the pandemic, like uh, information technology, like Google. They bought a million and a half square feet in downtown Manhattan, even though if they had really wanted to enable remote work, they could have enabled remote work. So, are cities still worth it? If you're 23, 24, 21 especially, this is the time to invest in your career. 
And you can always come back to where you want to live. You're just going to have more options about where you want to live if you invest in your career now and make yourself a more productive employee. Uh, cities, especially a city like Manhattan, is 100% still worth moving to. And you see a lot of people come here and they, they, they go by every penny they have just to enjoy experience living here for a couple of years. And the major banks are going to pound their chest. They're going to say, get back to work, be here five days a week. You will lose talent if you force people to come in five days a week. While you've seen kind of this uh, migration of a lot of individuals leaving major cities into smaller cities, majority of the population doesn't have the opportunity to kind of uh, move. And I think during time of uncertainty, it's important that we're making not only strategic investments, but meaningful investments into communities that need it most. Just remember that life is better spent live. Just think about how much better it was when you were around other people. That's what cities are delivering, where people are moving up and down all over the place, and you have the opportunity to learn from them, from their mistakes and from their successes. And good luck to you.